All right, ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished guests, so it's my great honor to have it here for this half-day symposium to talk about uh, geotechnical engineering. So we, as a researcher or engineers, about the geotechnical engineering actually got lucky uh, because we have many kids, many children. They are called Sandy, City, Clayley. Sometimes they are naughty, so could cause some problem to us. So it's just a little bit patience, and we want to learn more about them in order to let them behave better. So today, we're going to gather here, all talk about clay, silt, and sand. So first of all, I introduce the first uh, distinguished speaker, from H uh, HKST, uh, HKUST IS Distinguished Lecture by Professor Ross Bollinger. He will talk about constitutional models for presenting clays and plastic silt in earthquake engineering application. So Professor Ross Bollinger is a member of US National Academy of Engineering, the director of the Center for Geotechnical Modeling in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Davis. He received his PhD and master MS degree from civil engineering from the United University of California at Berkeley and a bachelor degree in civil engineering from the University of British Columbia. His research and professional practice are primarily related to soil dynamics, soil liquefaction, its remediation, seismic performance of dams and the levees, seismic soil pile structure interaction. So over the next, uh, the past 25 years, he has produced over 250 publications and has served as technical specialist on over 50 seismic remediation and size dam safety projects. He received many honors, including TK Sheng uh, Award from ICE, the Rough Pack Award, Norman Medal, Walter Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize, and Arthur Cassandrandi Professional Development Award, all from American Society of Civil Engineering, ASCE. And of course, election most recently to US National Academy of Engineering. So we here, we are very lucky to have him to present his latest work about silt and clay. So Professor Ross Ballinger, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Professor Wang, I really appreciate the invitation to come to uh, HKUST. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, we've had a lot of fun. You've been fantastic hosts. Uh, really a great experience, so really appreciate it. And uh, in deciding what to talk about, I would actually thought that initially we'd do something I wanted to talk with uh, Professor Wang about, and, uh, and then became a, a larger uh, discussion, so hopefully this uh, appeals to everyone else as well. Uh, it's a little bit of a detail uh, in one aspect of earth dam engineering. In particular, it's a choice of our constitutive model. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, our new constitutive model that we just put out this year. Uh, we call it PM4 Silt. We have a other model, PM4 Sand, which has been uh, out for a number of years, and this is kind of building on that. And it is particularly for representing uh, clays and plastic silts in earthquake engineering applications. And in <clears throat> setting a little bit of a stage for this, it's really driven by a need in the US practice. So I'm not familiar with practices locally in Hong Kong, uh, but around different parts of the world, they're very similar problems to those in the US. And that is when we're doing nonlinear dynamic analyses for embankment dams, or levees, we require constitutive models to cover quite a wide range of conditions. We've got to do soils that may range from loose to dense and dry and saturated um, under different overburden stresses and different sloping ground conditions. So we need our constitutive models to work under a broad range of conditions. And uh, when we do that, in our practice, we have a couple of models, or a couple of soils in particular. Uh, those soils that we think of as sand-like cohesion of soils that we think can liquefy during an earthquake. Well, we have a few models that are available. Quite a few complex models are available to us. But in a lot of embankment dams, we have large zones that are very important that are more uh, clay materials. 
and they might range from soft clays to the compacted zones of embankment cores and whatnot. And in representing these materials, we want to be able to model their tendency to cyclically soften and deform under earthquake loading. And there our options are rel relatively limited. And in particular, very common in US practice is to only see uh, people using very simple models like more Coulomb models or total stress hysteretic models for representing these kinds of soils. And that is a, often a very significant limitation in some of our applications. I'll come back to that in just a second. But just to give you an example, this is a project. This is a uh, project that is for Craig Davis and the LAD Department of Water, uh, Department of Water and Power. It's a, a, an example of a project by Rambat Hadidi and his group at Geopentech. They're analyzing this em embankment dam from Southern California. The, uh, the main body of the dam is largely clay materials uh, and it's overlaying uh, alluvium that was left in place. The concern is this stuff will liquefy in an earthquake. Uh, you'll deform, develop cracks, uh, lead to a breach of the reservoir, et cetera. In representing the alluvium and its uh, potential to liquefy during an earthquake, it was uh, represented with three different constitutive models, a, a re relatively simple practice-oriented more Coulomb cycle counting model, the UBC sand model by Peter Byrne, Mike Beatty, and other contributors, and the PM4 sand model by myself and Katerina uh, Ziotopoulou. And that was very handy because you could then look at modeling uncertainty. If you use three different constitutive models calibrated the same way, how much do, do the results change by? We'd like to be able to have multiple models. When it came to the embankment materials, which are dominantly the main material uh, involved in any deformation, are representing it with a more Coulomb model, which is elastic plastic and very simplistic in how it represents the behavior of these materials. And so that's where we would like something to be able to do better. Now here, I, I want to come back to what I was saying earlier. When I talk about um, whether these models are available or not available, I'm referring to uh, our US practice. And for a model to be available to use in practice, uh, you know, the model has to, one, exist, someone's have to develop, and there's lots of complex models for both clays and sands that exist in the literature. But the model then has to be implemented and in a form that is accessible to the industry to use so that others can check and or verify the calculations are done reasonably. So research codes often aren't accessible to the industry. The second thing is in the models are available, industry is going to test them. And when we test their behavior, if they do odd things, then very quickly we're not going to use those models. So that is why we have relatively few choices available to us. And we wanted something uh, that could do a little better. So in terms of where I'm going to go in this talk, I'm going to start with just a little bit of background on those types of properties that are important to us and that we're going to emphasize when we're developing and calibrating uh, material models. So the engineering properties that matter to us. Then I'm going to introduce this uh, PM4 SILT. It's just the acronym Plasticity Model for SILT. I'm going to do the model formulation, but I am not going to do all the equations because they're rather complicated. They would take a bit of time. I will give you the reference. You can go read it. Instead, I'm going to try and motivate you to want to look at it, and I'm going to give you a little bit more of an idea of how the model behaves. And when we do that, I'm going to be talking about uh, this distinction between primary and secondary parameters. And this will come to more of the philosophy of how we develop these models and how we make them accessible for people to use in industry or in practice. And so well, that, that's one thing I'll spend some time on as we go through, because it's a little different than a kind of a traditional mechanics approach to the modeling of behaviors. Then I'm going to go to the uh, performance of the model, and I'm going to walk through this and how we would use the model to illustrate that it's relatively friendly or easy for someone in industry to calibrate it using what the data they'll have. And we do that by using a, um, uh, a set of uh, primary parameters that the user picks, but all the secondary parameters are based on a generalized calibration. And I'm going to give you examples of the kinds of responses that you'll get using all those default parameters for the secondary parameters. And so it's kind of like, uh, it's going to be like driving your car. You're going to have a gas, a brake, and a steering wheel, and you're going to rely on everything else to be set by the manufacturer. And then just show you what you would get. If you have a big enough project uh, and a budget to support doing a little more sophisticated testing, then you may have some soil-specific monotonic and or cyclic testing. I'm going to use direct simple shear testing in the examples I show you. I'm going to do this for three soils to illustrate different kinds of abilities or flexibilities with the model. 
I'm going to show you a clay that generates strains a little more slowly than the generalized calibration. I'm going to show you a clay silt that generates strains a little more rapidly, is a little more weak, weaker. And then I'm going to show you a natural deposit of Fraser River silt up from Vancouver. And that one, we'll talk about how we represent properties over the thickness of a, a fairly thick deposit of uh, a low plasticity silt. And each one of these, I'm just going to flag what it would mean in terms of applying it in practice. And then we'll wrap this thing up. Okay, so with that, first thing is the, the properties that are important to us. So there's lots of behaviors of clays and plastic silts that are important in different applications, whether it's excavations or uh, foundations, whatnot, doing seismic uh, applications for dams. And for us, there's certain properties that are very important to us. And you can group those into the properties that affect the dynamic response. And these are gonna be our small strain modulus and or then the modulus reduction and damping that we get out of the constitutive model at different strain levels. So we gotta get those right to get the dynamic response of the system right. With those, then you need to know the strengths of the materials. You'll need to know the monotonic strengths and the cyclic strengths. And then if the loading is large enough to trigger strong yielding in those materials, it'll be very important for us to be able to model how that material accumulates shear strain at larger uh, loading levels or larger strain levels. So that strain accumulation rate. Those are the three things that we, we spend our time focused on. So to illustrate that, this is a, an example of some test data for uh, natural Cloverdale uh, Dale clay uh, near Vancouver from uh, Zergoon and Vade. And just looking at the stress strain response and the stress path response, a couple of things just to point out. One is you'd see that as it was uh, generating excess pore pressures, the effective stress has dropped to maybe about 20% uh, of the initial value. So that's like an excess pore pressure ratio of 80%. It doesn't get to 100% like we, we associate with liquefaction in sands, but we do generate pore pressures and they're fairly high. So maybe something on the order of 80% in this case. And then you see that once it generated those high pore pressures, it starts to accumulate strain fairly rapidly. The hysteresis loops are a little thicker than you'd associate with, with sands liquefying, but they show many of the same characteristics uh, associated with liquefaction. And in effect, they're, sands and clays, they're both same soils, and they, under cyclic loading, if the loads are strong enough, they will shear, and if they're contractive, they'll generate pore pressures and they will deform. So they're much the same kind of concerns. These are a couple other soils to kind of illustrate that it can vary quite a range when, uh, when we're looking at the lower plasticity end of the spectrum. So this is a non-plastic silica silt, and in this material, you can see the stress path gets to the origin, 100% excess pore pressure ratio, hysteresis loops are very narrow, looks just like liquefaction of a sand because it's essentially similar cohesionless material. And on the right is something with a little higher plasticity, thicker hysteresis loops, Notice a much slower rate of strain accumulation than we saw with the Cloverdale clay. So you can get a range of behaviors that you want to be able to model. Another important uh, feature is how the model responds to loads of different amplitudes or, or um, numbers of loading cycles. So that's often represented by plotting some measure of cyclic strength versus number of loading cycles. And when you look at this plot, this graph is normalizing the cyclic loads imposed on clays did I just drop? No, there we go. Versus the undrained shear strength. And when you normalize by the undrained shear strength, you see that uh, you know, these numbers are all about one. They get a little bit bigger than one for small numbers of loading cycles. And that's just because monotonic strengths are usually measured using standard uh, test procedures with slow loading rates. Cyclic strengths are going to be measured at higher loading rates, and we pick up a rate effect usually something on the order of 10% per log cycle of strain rate. And so you can get ratios a little bit over one because the cyclic loads are at a faster strain rate. And the slope of this, if you fit it with a power law as an exponent of something like uh, 0.1 to 0.15. And we need that so that when we're modeling subduction zone events where we've got lots of cycles, or we have small, uh, smaller magnitude but very local close-in events where we might have fewer numbers of cycles, we need the model to perform well across that range of loading conditions. 
Then I mentioned the dynamic properties. So this is often represented in terms of modulus reduction versus strain amplitude for strain amplitude controlled cyclic loading and the equivalent damping ratios. And so as this stuff starts to yield and modulus drops, you get more hysteresis uh, out of the material, more energy dissipation, higher damping ratios. And so in design practice, those types of behaviors are the things that we would be most focused on representing in any analysis or design. And that's what we want, a constitutive model to be able to reproduce. So with that, I'm going to take a look at the, the constitutive model. And just at a higher level, uh, start with that fact that it is a critical state and stress ratio controlled. It's a bounding surface plasticity model. It is built on the framework that is, underlies our SAN model and which was also kind of built on the framework of the Defalius-Manzari model. So it's just kind of evolved over time that way. The current modifications in it were to enable better simulating undrained monotonic responses uh, and cyclic responses of clays and plastic silt, so focusing on those behaviors. It is not intended for modeling consolidation problems or problems where strength evolves with regard to consolidation stress. It won't do that. It's not built for that, won't do it. So it's, it's intended for the types of dam problems I was describing. And it's currently uh, formulated to only work in plain strain because that really accelerates the computational speed. There's nothing fundamentally uh, limits it from going generalized, but our implementation is plain strain. It's also implemented as a user-defined uh, library, uh, DLL, for use with Itasca's FLAC uh, version 8. You can get a copy of the DLL, the manual, and all the example calibration files from a link. It's just off our UC Davis webpage, so you should be able to find that. And you can use the educational version of FLAC to uh, play with it and see if it uh, suits your problem. Okay, so the next thing about thinking of these models is uh, a little bit of uh, uh, the objective. What are we after? And, and here you get a little bit of philosophy. Uh, you have to get a little philosophical about this, and this is where I think things differ a little bit between a traditional mechanics approach to the use of these models and the way we like to use these models in an application and practice. So I'm going to start with just pointing out that if we think of complexity, you know, one of our goals <coughs> is to model the soil behavior realistically, and the real soil behavior is complex, and it's going to take a complex model to recreate that complex behavior. And so we... we don't shy away from complexity. When we look at that, we have a number of functional forms in the model for your plastic modulus, your dilatancy, your, your, we have a fabric tensor for representing um, fabric evolution and damage that then controls plastic modulus and dilatancy relationships. And so all those equations get fairly uh, complicated. But they are necessary for being able to model complicated behavior. One of the things we try to do is pick functional forms that make the model reproduce realistic behaviors. So our calibration is not just at the parameter level. If our model doesn't behave right, you're, we're changing the functional form of the equations to reproduce better relationships. So the calibration is also at the equation level. And then in terms of application, uh, trying to make it easy to use uh, in an application to practice, I'm going to limit this thing. It's going to have primary parameters. There's going to be four. One of them you probably won't use. And so in essence, there's three. And three of these parameters are the things that you're going to use based on common engineering uh, data that you'd get in any site characterization. The secondary parameters, of which there are 20 of them, are all going to have default values that are based on a generalized calibration that we like as it approximates the type of design correlations and typical elemental responses that we would use in our types of applications, right? So you might have different design correlations you like to use. You could adjust them to those. The defaults are calibrated to drive the way we like it. Okay, so now when any time you tell somebody that you have a constitutive model with 20 parameters, if they're from practice, they're going to cough and they're going to say, how do you ever use those parameters? How do you ever get these parameters? What are their meanings? I can't do this. They don't like it, right? Okay, so <clears throat> they want something easy, easy to understand. Okay, so this is my first car. This car was easy to understand, right? With a, a crescent wrench and a screwdriver, I could adjust the, the, the points, the carburetor, the timing, right? And the downside was I had to adjust them all every day. The car seldom ran right. It was unsafe. This was a terrible car, but it was easy to understand. That's my new car. 
I don't understand anything in this car, right? It's very complicated, but we rely on people in the automotive industry to calibrate all that computer automation under the hood to make it drive a certain way. And the complexity of the car makes cars more reliable, more robust, better driving, safer, you name it. Now, every once in a while, you do get a recall, right? So you might need to fix something. But in general, there's nothing wrong with complexity if it's made easy to use. And so the, 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 the 20 parameters is not the issue. It's is it easy to drive. And I like to make the pitch that we think the model meets that bill. So the, the, the general functions uh, for setting it up are just standard critical state line, an E log P space. Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So it's pretty straightforward. All the behaviors will be cast in terms of the uh, state parameter, just distance, your current void ratio to the critical state line for the same value of P prime. And then I'm going to just as an example of, of the philosophy or how to make these models usable is uh, how we specify undrained shear strength. So in this schematic, what I'm showing is just the stress uh, path on the, on the left and the, and the E log P on the right. And if you were in a critical state framework, one approach to this would be you would, you would try to define your critical state line, you would try to find your initial void ratio, and then the model would predict your undrained strength for you. That is not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to do it backwards. As a designer, you will have done your site characterization work, and you do that first. You go out and you characterize your site, you do your CPTs, your, uh, your field veins, you take your tube samples, you do your testing, you look at your stress history, you do everything you want to do to characterize your deposit, and you pick your properties. And then you're going to say, I think this is my best estimate of undrained strength, or it could be this, or it could be this, and I'm going to check it. After you've picked that, and you're going to go do your numerical model, you want your numerical model to give you back the undrained strength that you asked it to use. And so we work backwards. You input your undrained shear strength, and so Q is just two times undrained shear strength. If you've already specified M, you know P prime at critical state. If you know your P prime at critical state and you've specified your initial void ratio, you can back out the intercept. We set the intercept based on the user's input of the undrained shear strength, and that way the user gets back the undrained strength that they've chosen for design. And designers want to have control over that property. They don't want to abdicate that choice to the constitutive model. And that's generally the approach we take for the different behaviors. The other aspects of this are just uh, you have your critical state line, uh, you have a di uh, dilation line, you have a bounding surface line. The, the bounding and dilation lines are functions of state parameter. So as you shear it and the state parameter goes to zero at critical state, these two will collapse onto the critical state line and you'll deform with no further changes in volume or stress. And so that's how you get the um, critical state behavior in there. And then you have a small elastic core. And let me back up. What button did I hit? That one. Where am I? You gotta be careful which button you hit. There we go. That's the pointer. There's the elastic core uh, cone. So it's pretty small. That plot, let me go back. This whole graph is based on plotting the bounding and dilation lines for constant value state parameter. But in reality, when we load clays, we're going to be largely undrained in seismic events. So your void ratio is not going to change. If your void ratio is not changing and you're changing your effective stress, you'll be changing your state parameter. And if you're changing your state parameter, what happens is these surfaces are curved in this space. So for a constant void ratio, your, your, this is the bounding surface. It's going to be curved, go through the critical state point, and we've changed the form of the equation to be different on the wet side of critical from the dry side. It gives us two different parameters, and we can use this to control the amount of peak strength relative to critical state. And then on the dry side, we control the shape so we get reasonable stress paths relative to elemental responses. So a couple uh, details there on the bounding surface. Okay, so in terms of what the primary input parameters are, and again, I'm, that's it for the equations. What I want to do now is, is show you how the model drives, how it behaves, and then if you are interested, then you can go look at the equations. So in terms of how this thing drives, you're going to have three input parameters that you always have to give it. One is going to be the undrained shear strength. This will be the value at critical state. And as I showed you, it's going to set the critical state line so you get that strength back. 
in practice, you'll get that from whatever lab tests or field tests you've chosen to do as part of your site characterization. You're gonna need your uh, shear modulus coefficient. That is just to set your small strain shear modulus, Gmax. That always comes from a shear wave velocity profile or uh, you're gonna use your own preferred correlation to estimate it. There's a contraction rate parameter. This is your final uh, adjustment parameter that is going to control your cyclic strengths and that will control how your cyclic strength compares to the monotonic. In essence, it really has a big influence on the slope of that cyclic strength number of cycles, cycles plot. There is a, a fourth parameter that's optional. This has to do with uh, applying things in a nonlinear dynamic analysis of a, a, a boundary value problem where you might want to impose a drop in strength after shaking if you don't think it's fully represented in constitutively. Uh, we know, for example, we'll have a change from dynamic rates to static rates, so you might impose that. I'm not going to go through this today because we're going to focus on the dynamic calibration. And then the 20 values of secondary parameters are all getting default values, and then you can adjust them based on lab data as you see fit or not. And I'm going to show you what happens if you do or you don't. Okay, so first type of application. Let's suppose at a site, all you have is very simple data, maybe a basic site characterization, you got a CPTs, maybe you got a couple veins, you get no cyclic lab data, and you want to calibrate a model to be able to get some kind of reasonable response out of it. So the three parameters you would have to pick, you'd have to get your undrained shear strength, you would have to estimate your, your shear wave velocity or Gmax value, and then this will be an iterative uh, parameter that you have to uh, iterate to adjust to get the right ratio of cyclic to monotonic strength. And you'll always do that by using single element simulations. Right? So it, this is like very standard requirement in our practice is to take single elements after you've picked your constitutive models, put the material parameters into the constitutive model, drive a single element in simple shear or plane strain or whatever kind of loading path you want, and show what the model predicts for behaviors relative to your design correlations. Okay, so you're always going to do that, and so that'll be that last part right there. Then I'm going to show you what would happen is if you had that kind of uh, problem, that kind of approach, and let's suppose we had a site where the undrained shear strength as a ratio of the overconsolidation stress was, say, 0.25, kind of like a normally consolidated clay, or 0.5, maybe like having an OCR of 2 to 3, 0.75, maybe an OCR of 3 to 4. And for that, uh, typical values of shear wave velocity and corresponding Gmax values or Gnot values. And then the final calibration of those to produce reasonable slopes on cyclic strength curves, and I'll show you what those look like. So if you set those, and this next set of slides will just show you what you would get for behavior in terms of uh, the properties that I showed you earlier we would uh, consider. They'll be based on these default secondary values. And I just want to again emphasize that in practice, we always require that people show the results of these single element simulations to make sure that they've input the properties correctly and that the behavior is what you expect. Okay, so just uh, uh, starting with monotonic responses, these blue curves are what you get with a strength ratio of 0.75, and these are curves for overburden stresses of 25 kPa, uh, oh wait, no, there he is, 2,500, 400, and 1,600 kPa. The blue lines are for strength ratios of 0.75, red 0.5, black is 0.25, and then the stress paths at 0.25, you're wet at critical, you come over to critical state. The others, you're basically uh, almost on the dry side, that's on the dry side, and that's kind of right on the boundary. Okay? And so you get those kinds of behaviors. In terms of cyclic stress strain behavior, this is the stress strain, and that's the stress path response. You get about 80-90% uh, pore water pressure ratio. You get fairly thick hysteresis loops. You get strain accumulation that looks a lot like that Cloverdale clay that I showed you earlier. The lower curve is the same set of plots, but with a static shear stress ratio of 0.1. That means that we've got the model with a little static stress on it, like underneath the slope of an embankment, and then you got cyclic loading on top of it and it's accumulating strains in the downslope direction. And we like to just see how that model behaves, and then it continues to behave until it hits your bounding surface, and then it takes off, because this is a relatively weak material. This is the same set of plots. Now you're looking at something with a little higher strength ratio. A little higher strength ratio, you don't get as high a pore pressure ratio. This is exactly what we see in lab tests. 
you see the same kind of thick hysteresis loops. You see the strain accumulation goes down slope, but it never quite uh, runs away like the, the, the softer clay did. And then this is something with a little higher strength ratio. Same kind of behavior up here, not as high of excess pore pressure ratio, and the same kind of downslope accumulation. So it's just that's what you would get with default responses. In terms of cyclic strength curves, this is CSR or CRR um, versus number of cycles. This is for a cyclic strength ratio of 0.25 with uh, consolidation stresses of 100, 400, and 800 kPa, just to show that the model predicts about the same cyclic strength ratio independent of consolidation stress. That's what you'd expect in a clay. This is for the uh, strength ratio at 0.25 and 0.75. Here you're starting to get a little bit of overburden stress effect. So at least you know what it is. And I think that is a, another theme that we really emphasize in our practice is that you, you want to know what the constitutive model does. You don't ever want it doing things that you weren't aware it's doing. And so this allows you to see what cyclic strength varies with overburden. The slope on this is about 0.13 or so. So it's exactly where we wanted. That's not a mistake. The model was calibrated to reproduce that, that typical slope for clays. And this is showing the response. If you have static shear stress ratios of zero, like flat ground, stress ratios of 0.1 and 0.2, so like steeper and steeper slopes, showing that slopes are really bad for soft clays, no surprise, and they're not as bad for firmer or hard clays. And so that's just uh, showing it's behaving normally. In terms of G over G max behavior, these are the dynamic uh, stress strain curves under strain controlled loading up to a strain of about 0.3%. This is for the, the 0.25 strength ratio. This is going out to a higher strain level. When you get out to 1% strain, you're gonna get some cyclic degradation because you're building up pore pressure. And you take those and you plot them in equivalent G over G max. The, the simulation results are right in there with Vucetic and Dobry's curves for a PI between zero and 15. Very low PI. And that's, that was our choice, was to aim for generic calibration on a low plasticity material. And then the damping ratios are a little higher than we see experimentally. Uh, that's a pretty common problem with plasticity models, but it's better than you get with most total stress or uh, simplistic models. So doing better, not perfectly. Same set of graphs, start with a little stronger. You get the same story. You get about the same agreement, so everything's still looking okay. And then if you go to a stronger material, same, same story. So under generic calibration, you get something that at least is reasonable. It looks better than you'd get with not using a decent model. Okay, so that's default. The nice thing about a default set of calibrations is it also allows you to start a more detailed calibration with at least everything in a decent place to start with. So I wanna just show you what happens if you have data. And I'm gonna look at some lab data. These are materials uh, that we uh, use reconstituted specimens in some of our centrifuge model tests. And so these were getting calibrations to lab data that were performed by uh, Dr. Adam Price. Calibration process. Uh, I just wanna walk through the different steps that we use uh, to uh, kind of illustrate the sequence in which things are done. This makes it relatively uh, easy. There are other ways to do this, but this is one that we uh, find quite useful. So just to start, you're gonna need to select your primary parameters. And that means picking your undrained strength or strength ratio and your shear wave velocity and hence your, your modulus number. So those are your basic site characterization data you have to get. The second step is you'll pick any secondary parameters that you have data for. I mean, if you have the data, why not use it, right? So it's not too hard to have a, a knowledge about your void ratio or how your modulus varies with confining stress or the slope of your uh, recompression line or virgin compression line lambda and or your critical state friction angle. So if you have data for those, you can use them. At that point, you start doing single element simulations. You do your undrained monotonic uh, simulations. We have a driver just to do the monotonic uh, calibration. And you would adjust this one bounding surface parameter so that you simulate whether you get much of a peak strength before you drop down the critical state. So that's that one parameter to get the, the stress strain and monotonic undrained loading. You then switch and you do the uh, uh, calibration file for doing undrained cyclic loading at different strain amplitudes. This is for getting the G over G max and damping behavior for dynamics. And when you do that, there's one parameter, the uh, H0 parameter, which is just goes into the plastic modulus relationship and it allows us to adjust the G over G max curves to fit 
whatever target you prefer. This largely uncouples from that, so uh, doing these in this order is nice and convenient. This next stage is doing undrained cyclic loading with uniform cyclic stress ratios. This is to get the cyclic strength curves. There's going to be that contraction rate parameter, HP0, that we calibrate to get the right cyclic strength. And we're going to be looking at getting a curve of cyclic strength versus number of loading cycles. And you'll need some failure criterion. We often use 3% strain, but you can do it for any strain criteria you want. This also largely uncouples from that, so that if you've already done this and you move to here, the choices you made up here have a smaller effect on this. When you do get down here at this point, we then examine the stress-strain response from the cyclic loading, and we look at that larger strain and, and how those loops are generating shear strain, how rapidly they accumulate strain. At that point, if we want to do that better, there are uh, sets of parameters which will adjust features of the, the hysteresis at large strains. So you might play with those, get that strain accumulation looking better. Once you've done this, you just take all the parameters, come back up, stuff them back in again, and run them all once more just to make sure that they all look right. And you might repeat that two or three times. In general, I can do a calibration against, uh, if I've already done the site characterization, I can do this in about two hours. If you haven't done it before, it might take a day, but it's just a matter of getting used to it, and, and so the calibration isn't too bad. So I'm going to show you examples. This is a, a reconstituted silty clay. It's 30% silica silt mixed with 70% kaolin for building centrifuge models. And here, uh, PI is plasticity index is 20. It classifies as a CL. And we're going to have some monotonic and undrained cyclic strengths. In terms of calibration, we have the monotonic strengths. So you set the monotonic strength ratio. You set your small strain modulus to your desired uh, estimate of shear wave velocity. We know the void ratio. We know its compressibility. We know its critical state friction angle. We pick the stress exponent to be one based on the fact that the, the modulus is going to vary with overburden stress uh, more strongly than, than a cohesion of soil does. Then we're going to set the, these two numbers. We make them smaller than the default because this soil will accumulate strains more slowly. Last value is just adjusting the cyclic strengths, and we're done. And then just to show you what this looks like, first one is monotonic. This one doesn't look so good, but I, it comes up to a point that I'll get back to later. And that is this part right here, the simulations are relatively stiff compared to the simple shear data. And that is a real standard problem for us. And it could be a number of reasons. We know simple shear tests are, are, have problems with boundary conditions. It could be because this is an empirical geoverge max curve and it's not applicable to this young uh, reconstituted soil. And so you'd have to make a choice uh, which you want to prioritize. And I'll come back to that with the Fraser River silt. But because we picked Vucetic and Dobry's geoverge max curves for a PI of um, 20, that's why this is over stiff. This curve maps directly to this curve. The monotonic curve is just the same as this backbone. And so when you do that, if you want to match Vucetta Condobri, you can't match the lab data. If you match the lab data, you will be underestimating modulus over here. You'll have to decide which one you want. But that is your choice. And so there's the geoverge max and damping behavior. Here's the cyclic strength curves. The red points are the lab data. The blue curves are the simulations. We're a little steeper than the lab data, but that's what we're going to get. And then I'm going to show you the stress strain curves out of two of these. The first one is a test, a little higher CSR up here. So this is going to be the test on the top. This is a simulation. When you see that this thing has triggered high pore pressures, around 80% pore pressure ratio, and you're accumulating uh, one or so percent strain per cycle, or half to 1%, this is the simulation. And you see we're getting very similar rates of strain accumulation. That was those last two parameters that we, we have to tighten up a bit. Then the same set of parameters for the other test. As you lower the, the cyclic loading level, strain accumulation is much slower, and likewise the simulation will track that. So strain accumulation depends on load amplitude as well as those parameters I was showing you. But we can get the model to do a pretty good representation of the cyclic loading behavior. So now PI6. Same set of plots, so I'm going to go a little quicker now. When we look at this, it's the same logic. You have your monotonic test. It's got a little bit more non-plastic silt in it. Monotonic strength ratio is a little lower. You have different modulus. You've got different parameters. 
This parameter controls maximum pore pressure ratio. We let that go a little higher. We make these higher because this is a material that's going to accumulate strain rapidly. And then we finish off with the HP0. These are the monotonic responses. This time we're doing a little bit better, getting that peak and the softening. We're getting the stress path not too bad. In terms of G over G max and damping, we're right there on Vucetic and Dobri PI of zero, because that was our target. And the damping, same kind of behavior. When you're out here at 1% strain in this material, this degradation is showing it's basically liquefying under that kind of strain levels. And so that's, these are all undrained simulations. Cyclic strength curves, red are the data, the blue are the simulations. We're getting a reasonable fit with the data. And then in terms of the individual stress strain response and how it accumulates strains, you see that once this thing triggered high pore pressures, that, and in fact, under, under uh, loading, this one stops, but I'll show you most of the tests come down to zero effective stress. You see that it really accumulates strain, several percent in one cycle, and you can see the simulation is matching that rapid accumulation of strains. This is the second test, same kind of thing, large strain accumulation rate, and you map that up there. Pore pressure is getting almost to 100% and almost 100% in the simulation, or in the test. Okay, so those are, those are two reconstituted soils. Now what I want to do is do Fraser River Silt. So this is a application to a site in, uh, along the Fraser River in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, this was work with Dharma Widji Wakrimi at the University of British Columbia. He did all the lab testing, and then we worked together on this calibration. And it goes like this. This is along Steveston uh, Slough uh, Dyke, road number three. This is the CPT, cone penetration test, tip resistance, and the sleeve friction ratio. You see the tip resistance generally increasing with depth all the way down to, say, around 18 meters. This is a pretty typical profile for a nearly normally consolidated deposit of fine-grained soils. You see a lot of chatter in the tip resistance. It's interbedded with sands very frequently with these thin sand seams. And your friction ratio over here, we have undrained strength ratios from the CPT based on a cone bearing factor of 14 which is a pretty typical number for the Fraser River silts. And uh, the cyan points are the Nilcon vein shear test results. And you can see the vein shears are reasonably consistent with those from the CPT data. You see a lot of chatter in here. This chatter is just the chatter in the tip resistance when you express it in undrained strength. We're gonna emphasize the lower values because the higher values are gonna be all those sand seams giving you uh, unrepresentative high tip resistance. These strength ratios are a little higher than we're gonna get when we do the simple shear testing. And part of that is you have a difference in loading path, vein shear uh, versus simple shear, and we know that from work by many people like Biram and others a long time ago. But the other thing is these little sand seams provide drainage. And when you have thinly interbedded materials like this, that drainage is going to mean the CPTs are partially drained and the field veins can be partially drained and that is going to make those materials stronger. So we're a little bit worried about that. And in fact, you see that when you take close-up pictures of the Fraser River silt. So these are the silt particles. This is at a slightly larger scale. And you will see sand seams embedded in the, in the silt that are on the millimeter scale laminations. So those thin little sand seams provide for accelerated drainage near your cone tip and your vein. So we don't trust the vein shear and the CPT strengths as much as we do the simple shear data. So for that reason, we'll be emphasizing simple shear. And the deposit is essentially normally consolidated to depth, and so if we were to say add fill at the site, it would very quickly be normally consolidated. And it has about 10% sand size, mostly silt size, a little bit of clay size. The plasticity index is only about four. Liquid limits 30, it classifies as an ML by our unified soil classification system. And we're gonna have monotonic and cyclic undrained simple shear tests based on um, tube sampling system, uh, program that Dharma performed. And here I'm gonna show three calibrations. And the reason I'm gonna do this is when you, when you, you hand this model off to uh, someone in practice, uh, what happens is there's choices you make. You're gonna to have to make choices on, do you trust the lab monotonic tests for G over G max, or do you trust empirical G over G max curves? So you're gonna have one choice there. Then you're gonna to have to choose how you represent the shear wave velocity profile over the full 18 meters. And there's two different ways consultants will do that. And I'm going to show the three calibrations because they represent three different ways that three different people took on looking at this data. 
and show that even though they're non-unique calibrations, generally the results are pretty consistent. And so let me back up and just say that the first two calibrations, they will prioritize empirical GeoVirgy Max. They'll do the Vucetic and Dobry curves, and they will not match the monotonics. They'll have two different ways that they match the in-situ shear wave velocity. So that's going to be one and two. Calibration three will be the same as calibration one, but it will choose to prioritize fitting the monotonic shear data at the expense of getting the G over G max. So those are going to be the three calibrations. So the first part is you're going to want to match this shear wave velocity versus depth. So if you take that shear wave velocity, pro, or I'm sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong one here, the shear wave velocity is right there. We're going to fit that with a relationship, and that relationship is expressed as a function of the vertical effect of stress. So now that we fit that, we can take that relationship, and you can recall that the small strain shear modulus, or Gmax, is just density times shear wave velocity squared. We have the expression for the shear wave velocity, we plug it in there, and that turns into this expression here. Where the velocity was increasing at a power of 0.3 with overburden stress, so Gmax goes up as a power of 0.6. Now, the constitutive equation is pretty straightforward. The constitutive equation is the modulus parameter times atmospheric pressure times P prime divided by atmospheric pressure to an exponent. This equation is identical to that equation if K naught is a half, G naught is 500, and that exponent is 0.6. And so right there, you've directly matched your shear wave velocity profile. That's one approach. The second approach is you say, no, I don't want to do that. I, I want to pick NG for some other reason. And you might pick it to improve the stress-strain responses and those hysteresis loops or any other thing you want to do. And if you do that, then you have to change g naught as a function of overburden stress. And it's not hard to implement this with scripting language into FLAC. So this is really easy to do. And we just have g naught is now varying with overburden stress because this NG is not the same as 0.6. You pick anything different, g naught has to change with depth. The end result of that, though, is the same curve. So the red curve is if the exponent on, on G uh, modulus equation is 0.6, it's constant value of NG, you get this G max and that shear wave velocity profile. If instead, in the blue line, you change the exponent to NG, then your G naught is going to vary with depth. And if your G naught varies with depth, you get the same G max and the same shear wave velocity. So you get the same agreement, either approach. Calibration process is essentially the same as I showed before, just a couple little differences, which I'll, I'll, I'll just flag. Uh, first is, you set your monotonic strength, you pick your G naught and now your exponent to match, not a modulus of a, of a sample, but a modulus of a profile. Get the whole thing versus depth. Again, you set void ratio, compressibility, and friction angle based on the lab data you have. You select your exponent on the wet side of the, of the, the bounding surface because we have non-strain softening response. So that turns to a value of 1. We select our H0 value. And here you're either going to try to match a G over G max curve or you're going to try to match the monotonic DSS. You can't necessarily get both. You're going to get one or the other if they're not consistent. We get high pore pressures, so our, this parameter has got to be set higher to let it generate higher pore pressures. We calibrate HP naught, we adjust the stress strain curves, we repeat the loop just like before. So very much the same as before other than this how we treat Gmax. This is a, a list of the parameters that go into it. I said there's 20 secondary parameters, but many of them are things like hourglass and control and other things, so they're not listed here. These are all the default values. This is just showing that which parameters have we changed and which ones have we changed this, uh, the same for all of them. And so that's the set of parameters. This is showing the responses. This is the monotonic undrained simple shear responses. Shown in here, the gray lines are the monotonic tests. These red lines are the first quarter cycle of cyclic tests. Now, for whatever reason, the first quarter cycle of the cyclic tests are actually stiffer than the monotonic tests. And when you look at the details of some of the monotonic tests, they look like there's a little compliance problems early in the loading. There might have been some sampling disturbance issues. Either way, that's a pretty big range of stiffnesses from the red to the gray. And so I had some concerns there. What we decided was that if we're going to do G over G max, uh, we do Vucetic Dobry, and you get this blue line up here in this red simulation. If you wanted to, to match the lab data, we would bias ourselves to 
the upper end of the experimental data. And so I'm going to just zoom in here at the smaller strains. So now I've changed the scale of the axis, so this is now 0 to 3 percent, and now you can see more of the test data. And what we've done is we've chosen to take the upper end of the measured responses in the monotonic simple shear test and the first quarter cycle of the cyclic test and say that's about as soft as we're willing to let the model go. And you'll see that's going to give you a pretty low G over G max curve, and we didn't want to go any further. And then versus the default G over G max. So that's our two different calibrations, or three different, I guess. Now they're all three shown here. The left figures are for the first calibration, number one. The next two figures are for calibration two, and the next two figures are for calibration three. G over G max and damping curves, this one, you see the simulations for um, two different overburden stresses, 100 to 200 kPa. That's because 100 is like near the top of the soil profile, the 200 is like down at 18 meters. So we're trying to just see the behavior over the thickness of the soil profile. And you see it's modest dependence on overburden stress, and it's right in there between the PI of 0 and 15, and that was targeting that PI of 4 or 5 that we had. The second set of data has got the same G over G max and largely the same um, damping behavior because both of these were targeting that. The third gives a much lower G over G max and a higher damping curve because this was trying to model the simple, the monotonic test. When you try to model the monotonic test, they were softer than these empirical curves. So those are your choices. Stress strain curves out of those, this is just showing calibration one, two, and three. Interestingly here, these will show more cyclic degradation at the strain level. The softer G over G max curve are not quite degrading even at 0.3% strain. In terms of cyclic strain curves, this is calibration one, two, and three. It's the same experimental data in red. And then the simulations are at the two different overburden stresses. I should point out that the lab data showed that all the data, monotonic and cyclic strengths, normalized by overburden stress. And so I'm only, instead of making a cloud of data, I'm only showing the data at 100 kPa. And you can see the simulations are a little steeper than the lab data, but at least we get in this range of cycles, not too bad. A little steeper for the second calibration, and that's because of that G or G max behavior. And, and then it gets flatter for the third calibration. We get a little the little softer G over G max behavior, it actually tracks the cyclic strength curves a little better. Now, these set of plots, I'm going to go through these. I'm going to show an experimental test. So out of those cyclic simple shear tests that I showed you uh, from Dharma, I'm going to show the test on the top, and then I'm going to show you calibration one, two, and three in a row. And so you see that the cyclic test, you get up here around uh, maybe 90, 95% pore pressure ratio. You see the strain accumulation is, is some fraction of a percent of strain per cycle. And then down here, you see you get about the same pore pressure ratio, and we're getting pretty similar strain rate accumulation. Uh, and the hysteresis loops are a little thicker than you get experimentally. So calibration two does a little better on the stress strain curves, and that's because the, 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 the stress exponent was changed to improve that, and as a result, you get this better, and you had to do the other details on genome. The third calibration does it even better because if you're modeling the, the stiffness in the simple shear and monotonic, not surprisingly, you do a little bit better with the cyclic as well. Whether you believe that or not is subject to your, your, which one you trust more. So that's one test. And you go to the second test. So a little higher loading level, a little higher strain accumulation. This is calibration one. It's still tracking the strain rate accumulation about right. Hysteresis loops are a little too thick. Calibration two, it's a little better. Calibration three, it starts looking even maybe a little better. Then you go to the third test. This is a higher loading level. Strain accumulation is more rapid. Calibration one, calibration two, calibration three. So we can see that the model works reasonably well as we change from different loading levels across these different tests. So we're almost at the end. Just to summarize the calibration uh, process for this Fraser River silt, first two calibrations, they really only differed in how they approximate the in-situ shear wave velocity profile. Other than that, they were pretty similar. They, they had similar target responses. They, they tracked a similar uh, empirical correlation for G over G max and damping. And the simulated responses were pretty close in all regards except for some minor details on how wide the hysteresis loops are. 
Calibration three focused on approximating the monotonic stiffness at the expense of not fitting the empirical G over G max as well. Now the calibration then turned out to probably give a little bit better simulations of the cyclic test results on average. But here I just got to point out that you would have to make a choice. This really, uh, it's, it's not easy up front to say you should always believe the monotonic stiffness from a lab test or you should always believe the empirical G over G max. There are things that you can look at in the quality of your lab test data to see if there's hints of sampling disturbance problems. So you look at how well your pre-consolidation stress is defined, you look at how, uh, how much compression you get um, during uh, reconsolidation, you look at the early part of the stress strain curve, you put, it, you put all those hints together and you might decide that you believe the lab data or you see a problem with it. And you're going to have to make that choice and often you just cover it with a little bit of sensitivity study. But overall, all three calibrations are pretty reasonable for application in a practice. And the reason is the differences in these, these uh, three calibrations are going to be small relative to everything else you will have to deal with. We don't know the design motions, so you're going to have the uncertainty in the earthquake loading, the earthquake loading's frequency content. You're not going to really know the undrained shear strength, so you're going to have to do a sensitivity on it. You're going to have many other things that you're going to, you're going to have uncertainty from. And so just to wrap up. Uh, what I tried going through today with you was introducing this model PM4 silt. Um, we developed it for the purpose of modeling clays and plastic silts in nonlinear dynamic analyses for applications to mostly dams and levees. So it's very specific to that. We're emphasizing behaviors that are typical for soils that have uh, stress history normalized behavior, like plastic clays and silts. It is not for non-plastic silts and sands that would switch over and use our constituent model PM4 sand. That is the distinction between them. Focuses on key behaviors for seismic applications. It is not applicable for modeling consolidation problems or those types of problems with strength evolving with history. Calibration process. Uh, the, the, the overall process is going to depend on what you have for information. It always requires that you take responsibility for the undrained strength, the shear modulus, and the cyclic strength. And so you're going to pick those. We give you default values for the secondary parameters so you get reasonable behaviors. It will be better than using a more Coulomb model or a total stress hysteretic model if even you have to take those default values. At least it's more realistic. The secondary parameters, though, you can adjust them if you have soil-specific data, and I tried showing you different kinds of data and how you might do that. The model is available. It's online. Uh, you can get it at uh, my UC Davis website. We give the manual with all the equations, the examples, and all those uh, default calibration results. We provide calibration files so you can do the monotonic, the cyclic, and the, and the G over G max um, calibrations. And then you can go to a task of site and get the, 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 the trial version, and then you can play with it. I want to point out we always appreciate hearing from users' experiences. Um, this I mentioned earlier, you know, we like cars that drive easy, but there are recalls. At different times, and so periodically someone finds something the model's not doing quite right, they let us know, it gives us something to fix, we get another version. So by all means, if you try it out, good or bad, let us know how it works for you. I want to thank uh, Katarina Ziotopoulos, my colleague, uh, all the model development uh, between the two of us. Adam did all the testing on the reconstitute soils, and Dharma did the testing for the Fraser River Delta. So uh, funding been very fortunate with our Department of Water Resources and National Science Foundation. Thank you. So, may I ask you a question about uh, your fundamental understanding about uh, the soil liquefaction? So, because we're pretty clear about uh, the clean sand, the cyclic behavior, so inclusion of the silt contents, so what is the fundamental physics you could expect that changes the behavior? Um, so there's, there's, you know, we, talk, we were talking earlier about more your work on discrete element modeling and, and down at the particulate level. So but without going there, just moving up in terms of what it means in more of these uh, continuum model parameters, I think the, the, what we see the silt is you have to draw first a distinction between the nature of the silt, because we often think of silt based on size, but it's really more about the mineralogy of these materials. Uh, a very small amount of, of clay-sized uh, or clay minerals in a silt 
really increases the compressibility of these materials. And so what we see is, is, is in terms of the con uh, more continuum models, is adding the fines increases compressibility, which is essential for when you're cyclically loading. You're, you're cyclic loading, you're generating plastic contraction, and that is offset by elastic rebound. And so the, the compressibility has a strong influence on all the cyclic responses as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the second thing is it has a strong effect on the dilatancy. And so for a given set of state, the amount of dilatancy that you mobilize um, goes down if the materials are more compressible. At least that's what we're seeing. And so it's really, uh, I would put it in terms of it's the compressibility, the plastic modulus, and the dilatancy. And we see uh, quite a difference depending on uh, not just adding the fines, but also the gradation overall density. So as you go to well-graded um, materials like gravelly sands, that well-graded material has a stronger dilatancy than a uniform sand. And so it's that kind of spectrum across those. Those are the three. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Boulanger. Uh, so my impression about a model, oh, I like this complex model, uh, like a modern car. <laughs> Even I, I don't know the complex function, but what I know is uh, as long as I input the four primary parameters and use all 20 uh, other parameters as default values, it still work quite well. That's my first impression. Then in terms of ways of calibration, so, uh, so three methods, uh, so my question is, uh, uh, Seems today what you presented uh, are primarily uh, element test level. Uh, if I compare uh, simulation outcome with field performance, so in that case, then uh, which uh, type of calibration method works uh, better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's a it's a great question. Uh, so I'm I'm working on having something to kind of illustrate that. So it's got two parts to it. So let me um, let me say this. Uh, so let's say we're looking at the, the levee along that site, and, and you're looking at the response of how this sloping structure is going to deform over top of this soft deposit. So if, if you're looking, so, and I'm going to also add that we often have to do these things in um, several uh, return periods. So you might, you might have something like a more frequent operating basis event you design for, and then a rare event, and then maybe even check it for a, a, a rare event. So you're going to check it at different hazard levels. So if you have a very high hazard uh, loading, uh, and the loading is strong enough to drive everything into strong yielding, you're going to get the same answer. Because the, the larger deformations are really going to be driven by the strength and the accumulation of strain at large strains. And in that sense, they're all pretty similar. And based on you know, the other examples we worked with, you'll see very little difference in performance when you're driving the demand really high, because the models give all the same strength. Uh, back in, if you're looking at a moderate level of, of uh, hazard or a lower level of hazard and you weren't actually driving it um, to exceed its strength frequently, then you can get cases where the response would be more sensitive to the small strain modulus because you'd be questioned like whether you're hitting a resonance, say a site response. And that is going to depend on the thickness of the deposit, the frequency content of the earthquake. But it's easy to construct a problem that is sensitive to the shear wave velocity profile or the G over G max behavior. So if you ran those three models and they were different, uh, say at that lower hazard level because of the stiffness differences, they would all also be sensitive to probably the input motion. So if you check several different earthquakes, their frequency content, you'll see sensitivity in the system response, not just to the material model, but to the earthquake frequency content and other details of the model. So the answer is, that, yeah, I would look at it more that if the modeling, those three model calibrations gave you differences in response, it, use that information as an indicator of what the system's sensitive to, and you're, you're, you're going to find that it's probably sensitive to other things closely related. And then other problems, it, it, you'll see no difference. So, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Bollinger. Uh, so, I have a question regarding the fabric effects. Like, uh, we know that different uh, method of preparation of samples give different type of fabric, yeah. so different type of strength strengths as well. So, uh, so do, in your model, is there any parameter which controls this uh, fabric effects? Yeah, um, let me, the, the, the model uses a, uh, the fabric tensor 
that the uh, Defalius Manzari had, and it's really uh, driven by these micromechanical models. Giannis and, and Majid had looked at how these micromechanical models talk about it. You know, basically, you can think of it as if you've got two particles and this one rolls uphill, mm -hmm. then if you reverse direction, it's got to roll downhill. And so what they put in theirs was they tracked this, this indicator that they'd been growing fabric in one direction. And when they changed, they got enhanced contraction on reversal. That was their model. We took that and we, when we built on that, we, we tracked that as well as kind of a, um, instead of not just making contraction rate depending on direction, we also changed uh, the plastic modulus. Because if, if you're gonna roll downhill, you're also easier to slip downhill. So we changed the plastic modulus to also depend on um, fabric and uh, fabric history. And then we added the fabric history terms and we uh, use a cumulative um, fabric term where we add up all the, the fabric formation as, a, as an absolute quantity to break down um, the elasticity. So it's kind of like if you're breaking the cementation in a natural soil and if you get, you people have done lab tests, if you do lots of plastic straining, you can degrade the elastic modulus. So in there, so having said that, the parameters and Again, I'm going to apologize. I, I think I missed some on this table, but I got them earlier. Uh, there should be a Z-max, which controls the maximum amount that you can get of enhanced contraction. There is a um, CZ, which controls how fast fabric grow during plastic straining. There is a, a C-epsilon, which controls how that controls um, how rapidly uh, uh, strain history uh, um, controls how rapidly the strain accumulation has that plastic uh, term in it and it dis disappears as you get to a certain point. So how, uh, that's what that one is. Without pointing at the equation, it's kind of hard to explain that one. And then there is one missing on here, uh, and it's a, it's a C, a degradation factor on the elastic modulus. So if you accumulate plastic strain, it degrades modulus. So not answering your question very concisely, but if I come back to it, basically we have that fabric tensor term um, its history and its cumulative values mapped into the dilatancy and the plastic modulus uh, relationships in several different ways. And that's why when I put the equations up, it kind of takes a while to walk through each one and explain how each one influences different features of behavior. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one more question. Uh, if you go uh, further a few slides, uh, you, have shown, you have shown the, uh, in the calibration three behavior, right? So if you go further, like yeah, something, yeah, something here. So if you see the experimental data and the uh, uh, simulation data, I think uh, uh, in the simulation data, the dilation and contraction behaviors in the initial few cycles weren't uh, properly uh, 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 simulated, I guess. Because the, do you think we need some extra parameters to control this factor as well? So you're talking about right here in the beginning? In the begin yeah, in the beginning. After, if you suppose two, three cycles, uh, yeah. right after two, three cycles, if you see the experiment result, there is a contraction and dilation. You can uh, easily observe. But in the simulation data, I think it's always a contraction, something like that. Ah, yeah. Okay, so I showed you the bounding surface model, uh, the lines, right? So you got, a, you got M, a critical state M, yeah. and the dilation line is going to be down here. Yeah, okay. So you will get no dilation until you hit the dilation line. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So yeah. the constitutive model, yeah, you're right. It's showing always either it's elastic unloading contraction, elastic contraction, whereas the simulations, I mean, the actual tests show I increments of dilation. Is that what you're pointing out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The dilation angle should be a little lower or something like that? Um, oh, man, you're picky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is my PhD student, Wivik. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's a really good point. Um, there, there, there's, there's two, two parts to this. Uh, the, the short answer is I couldn't get it to do any better. So that's, that's the short answer. And you've picked up on a detail that for the life of me, I can't figure out how we get that. And I think it's an inherent limitation of using a bounding surface plasticity approach where you have discrete image points and then you're trying to track what is a continuum behavior with these imaginary discrete points of reversal and projections. And when you put them all together, you're going to make compromises on what you want. And so if we try to lower the dilatancy line to kind of track that kind of behavior, it generates other kinds of problems. And so as a compromise, we let this one go. So that's the one answer. Uh, you know, there's some models where you're getting away from the bounding surface approach and you try to do like non-, non uh, 
yeah, just get away from the bounding surface approach if we want to try to catch those details. And, and we couldn't do any better with what we've done so far. Second point, though, is there is an aspect of simple shear testing that having done a lot of simple shear testing, you have to take them with a grain of salt. And, and the reality is most uh, simple shear devices have compliance between the top platen and the bottom platen, so that when you load the device, there tends to be a rocking of the top cap. And you're, you're really trying to build the device to be as rigid on the top so that you don't rock. But if you, you try to make it really rigid, then you have, you have to have really good bearings, but you don't want to have friction in the bearings. And so you have this play, and, and sometimes you see that kind of path having a, a bit of an artifact from compliance in the rocking of the top and bottom platens of the simple shear device. And so I'm not entirely convinced that that is a material response. But that's, that's kind of terrible for a numerical modeler to go, oh, it must be something wrong with the lab, right? <laughs> so uh, it's probably a little bit of both. Thank, thank you so much for listening. Okay. Looks like a great model, practical model. Has this model been used in well-documented case studies? And if so, how how well did the numerical modeling compare to the state compare with the case study? Yes. So uh, perhaps I'll be fortunate enough to be invited back one day to uh, talk about that. Uh, so uh, as background for Craig's question, if we go back to the use of our PM4 sand model on a lot of the work for uh, Department of Water and Power projects. Uh, we followed the same uh, approach with this model in that uh, we released the model in, uh, I think, January or February. But this model has been out uh, with beta testing uh, friends of ours for a couple of years. One of the first applications was uh, um, not a case history, but a, but a, a testing against other models for a dam in, in Georgia. Glenn Ricks uh, did that work. And then we've been working through different ones. Uh, now Jack Montgomery at Auburn University has done the Fourth Avenue landslide with it. I just finished doing uh, um, Austrian Dam on Lake Elsinore from the Loma Preta earthquake to see how it does for the compacted materials. In site response problems uh, and, and kind of smaller deformation problems, we've done Chark Canal with it, the wildlife site. Uh, Ed Idris is, is using it uh, to walk it through Treasure Island again, see how that worked there. And then we have some other business friends who have used it in comparisons to other total stress models. So those aren't case histories, but they are various comparisons to other models. And so the advantage of those are uh, just from the point of view that when you see the difference in behavior between a hysteretic total stress model or a more coolant model or this nonlinear model, then you can look and see if those differences actually make sense. So yeah, we accumulated quite a bit of comfort with the model, been very happy with it. Um, before we put it out on the street. All right. Thanks, uh, Professor Bollinger, You're for welcome. your presentation of this uh, new car. So I would like to test drive your car yes. uh, because it's made by Ross Bollinger. So again, let's thanks Professor Bollinger for his excellent talk. Thank you.